All right. So it's 11.07. Let's go ahead and continue our meeting. Uh, I've been requested, uh, instead of going to item 6.3C, we're going to jump real quick to item 6.5, I believe it is. Yes, and get an update from Dr. Pace. And so Dr. Pace, if you are here, I know I saw Sarah jump on. There you are. Hi, good, uh, good morning. Good Thank morning. You. Yeah, we've got a meeting with the testing task force at 12.30, so I appreciate you helping me get get on on the schedule here. So good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to speak again, Mr. Vice Chair and um, Supervisors. Um, this is the COVID update. And um, basically, we are at over 1,000 total cases since the beginning of the uh, pandemic. We're at 1,092 was the last uh, count. Um, we went up over 1,000 last week. We've got 11 people in the hospital now, and 21 people have passed away. Uh, the uh, Sarah will show the, uh, well, actually, Sarah, why don't you go ahead and show the the data now. I mean, basically, we're in a significant surge both locally and around the state, and uh, Sarah can show you the specific data, and then I'll come back and pick up from there. So, thank you. And Jake, if you have not made Sarah able to share her screen, can we make sure and that's possible? Yeah, she should be good to go. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Okay, I'm going to give you a quick update. Um, first, we're going to start by looking at uh, cases in California, and then we'll look at uh, trends and cases in, in Lake County. Um, so these data were updated yesterday by the state, and you can see that we have almost 1.4 million cases in the state. And this dark blue line is the line that everyone is paying attention to and really concerned about. So this is the 14-day average of new cases that you can see has started to increase since late October to early November to a high of about 18,000 um, new cases per day in California. Um, next to this, and you can see now a couple weeks ago, we were, we were bumping up against our peak from the summer and now we've well exceeded that. Um, on the right, we're looking at COVID hospitalized patients in the state of California. Um, and at the state level, uh, they expect about 12% of cases, or they've seen that about 12% of cases become hospitalized a couple weeks later. So that's what you see here on the right is that 14 day average of COVID hospitalized patients. And you can see that it's lagging behind about by two weeks, the, the increase in new cases. So we really started to see that take off middle to late um, October. So now we have currently about 11,000 COVID patients hospitalized in the state of California. Um, so the the slope of these curves are, are what is really alarming. Um, here I'm showing that same exact graph here, but then next to it are showing you the at the state level the number of COVID deaths, and again, which also lags from the from first known infections. But here we see the increase in the total number of deaths due to COVID. Um, almost 20,000 in the state of California will hit 20,000 probably today. Um, and this is the, the indicator everyone's really worried about and paying attention to and um, is what the, the new stay-at-home order that came about was that last, last week. Um, so there are about 1,700 ICU beds available in the state of California. You can see how it's been declining since about mid-October. Um, here I'm showing you um, the latest state data, the regional ICU capacity, that is the metric. So just as a reminder, um, when a region, the regions are listed here, goes below 15% uh, remaining ICU capacity, that's what um, uh, sets off the, the new stay at home order. Um, 
you can see that Southern California and San Joaquin Valley are already under that order. Um, at, we're in the, this Northern California region, which was about 28% yesterday. The new number will be released at noon today. It's dropped a few percentage points um, since yesterday. So here in Lake County, we have, as of just a few minutes ago, um, 1,131 cases. We have 158 active cases. This is the most we've seen by far in Lake County since the beginning of the pandemic. So about 160 people with known active infection right now. Um, 952 recovered, and as Dr. Pace shared, 21 deaths. Um, we've seen a 16% increase in cases just in the last seven days and a 37% increase in cases about from about two and a half weeks ago. Um, and I was just looking at the, the geography of it um, and from a week ago to today have seen increases in the number of cases in nearly every zip code um, in the county. So we have, um, it's definitely community-wide new cases, active infection. Um, just again, to speak to some of the, the, the steep curve we're seeing here in Lake County, um, here are the number of new cases by month. So Sarah, you can, can you hold on one second, please? Because the, there's a box that we're seeing on this screen and I, I didn't even see what the title of that last oh. screen was because of that box that's on here. If we and and I believe that would be, Jake, if we can get rid of the remote assistance uh, window. Um, is there somewhere down there that, I'm sorry, somewhere down there that could grab that mouse for me? Sorry about that. I, I'm just trying to trying to follow, and I'm not sure what it is I'm following. And then, Jake, if it's possible to go to the view options and uh, on the top, top. No. Let that me works. Hear. No, the box right there, uh, Sam, right there where the arrow is right there. It's in the way of the title. Yeah, that one. There you go. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Did you guys get it moved? I'm sorry about that. Yeah, no worries. Sorry for the interruption. No worries. Should I go back a couple slides or just pick up from here? No, that's fine. Right from right here, I guess is good. We're good. Okay, great. So here we see the number of new cases by month with over 300 cases in November, and this is what we're seeing to date in December as of this morning. Um, and here's the number of new cases by week. Um, just briefly wanna highlight a few things here. So this, this week of November 22nd to the 28th, this week is what makes up our new tier assignment that should come out today. In Lake County, if we have more than 43 cases, that, that puts us in the purple tier. So we'll have another tier assignment of purple or widespread today. And then you can see in gray, the, these numbers will change as we receive more electronic lab reporting. But um, for last week, we're already seeing over 100 cases. Um, and I'm just going to go through this pretty quickly. This is, um, this is the lag data that makes up our tier assignment today. But while we, Lake County is here in the, the green line, um, well, significantly lower than the state daily case rate and the Northern California region, we're seeing about the same sort of rapid increase. So this increased about 300% from about five per 100,000 to, um, now my graph is cut off, to almost 20 per 100,000 um, in the month of November. What is Rancho? Again, it's the uh, region of Northern California health officers. I don't know what the A stands for. I forget. Oh, Rural Association of Northern California health officers. Okay. So I, I highlighted that because that's right. Our, our regional, uh, how the state has determined our regional health system, our ICU metrics. So tracking their rate as well can help us think about what we can expect for our regional ICU capacity. Um, here, just briefly, the, the testing positivity in Lake County has gone up significantly in the last month. So that's shown by the orange line here. 
So it was at about 2% at the beginning of November, and it's at its highest point since the pandemic began at about 8.4%, which is exactly the state seven-day average, and, and Lake County has always been below that. Um, these blue bars are testing, the rate of testing. So you can see um, that testing has gone up significantly during this time, similar to the state. Um, and a few things I just wanted to highlight what we're seeing locally is that we're looking here at cases in purple compared to the county population in this lighter blue. We see that 28% of cases in Lake County are between the ages of 20 to 34, yet they make up only half or 14% of the population. Um, and I additionally, what I've been watching is that we've seen, along with the geography with new, new infections throughout the county, also seeing, uh, like some other communities, a decrease in uh, Latino cases and an increase in white non-Hispanic cases and Native American cases. And we're, we've seen that over about the last month in Lake County. Um, Latino cases made up about 50% of cases prior to November, and now they're about 42% of cases. Um, and this is just my last slide um, with, you know, 160 known active infections right now. Um, I th and throughout the community, I, I think that the settings where transmission is happening, um, everything that we can do as individuals and as a community to try to prevent new infections is really critical right now. We're seeing uh, spread in community settings. We're seeing spread in congregate living settings, which public health is working hard to um, prevent and control. We're seeing spread to a smaller degree in workplaces and then of course within households. Um, so that's all I have to, to share. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so as you can see, we're, um, the situation is, is very concerning. And part of what you see from this is that when the positivity rate goes up, there's a little bit of a lag time before the case rate goes up, and there's a lag time before the hospitalizations and uh, people passing away goes up. So, and our case rate, our case positive, I'm sorry, our test positivity rate continues to rise and continues to be very high. So that's worrisome for the, as the wave kind of moves down the next couple of weeks. And I, I think a lot of what we're seeing now is uh, the post Thanksgiving rise that we were concerned about that. Um, and we're seeing that all over the state as well. So the, um, at this point, we are in the purple tier. We've been in a little over a week, and um, we are not in the stay-at-home order. About 85% of the state is in this stay-at-home order, which is a lot like what it was back in um, April or May under that. There's uh, no outdoor dining allowed, no gatherings outdoors, things like that. But in the, uh, we will, Sarah was showing that Rancho uh, configuration of the northern California counties, which we're part of, which includes Mendocino, Humboldt, Del Norte, Trinity, um, Tehama, uh, a couple more. It does not, Napa and Sonoma and Solano are in the Bay Area counties. Um, so when the region goes into 15% um, ICU availability, that's when the state is saying that they will uh, start us on the stay at home orders. I wouldn't be terribly surprised if at some point the state just makes a statewide um, declaration that everybody's going to be under it. But at this point, they've not been saying that at this point. So, you know, our, our ICU rate has been um, reasonably stable over the last week or so. It's traveled between like 21 and, tw or I mean, 23, I think, and 28%, something like that. It's kind of moving back and forth. So, um, uh, a, a, few, a week or so ago, we were at about 16% uh, before they even put this thing into effect. And so the concern was is we were going to move into it in about within the week or two. Now it's looking a little more reassuring, although the numbers continue to rise uh, for us in the area and in the region. So we'll just, we'll just see how it goes. Um, the, uh, what we're seeing around the county is 
outbreaks in a bunch of different places. Actually, the jail, which is what we've been working with for probably a month, maybe a little more, that's quite stable now. I believe the total number of cases of um, inmates there that tested positive was something like 28 and a couple staff. Those folks have all completed their quarantine and isolation, and so they're back to more normal activity. The, so, there, it's, and there have been no new cases recently. We are, the jail staff is testing people at um, um, intake and uh, and we're also kind of monitoring all the, uh, regularly throughout the time there. But uh, I think really quick action on the part of the jail medical staff and the jail custody staff has uh, kind of stopped this outbreak and uh, I feel like we've, uh, we're very fortunate for that. Um, there's been an outbreak in one of the tribal communities that's been this quite significant at this point. It's, something, it's probably more than 80 cases. Um, it's very worrisome. There's been three hospitalizations. Nobody's passed away from this yet, but it's a very vulnerable population and we're very concerned about this. Uh, again, we're trying to do testing, a pretty aggressive testing, and then trying to um, encourage people to stay home and, and not be mixing and not be doing uh, community activities and moving amongst the houses. And uh, so we're, we're working with tribal health, we're working with the tribes, we're working with the state and trying to contain this as best we can. Um, the different nursing homes are having a few small events, but there's no big outbreaks at this point. The schools are having, there's multiple, uh, again, small little uh, clusters that are happening in the schools, but no major outbreaks at this point. Several of the businesses in the community are, we're seeing the same thing where they, a case or two pops up, uh, but as they have been cooperative in terms of helping us connect with the contacts and shutting down when necessary so that it can be disinfected. So we're just, you know, there's just a lot of work going on in the community of keeping track of things and, um, trying to address the different cases as they pop up and having to shut down businesses, close schools for a little bit, these different things to try to manage and contain it. Um, uh, there's a lot of these, just these different fires popping up around the community at this point. Uh, but the most significant outbreak at this point is in the tribal community. So to talk about the response in the county, the uh, disparity measures that Sarah talked a little bit about, we are seeing a change in the kind of the configuration of who's getting it, who's getting the virus, who's the most vulnerable. There's a couple of uh, RFPs that got posted earlier, uh, about a week ago now, for one for working with the Latino population, the other with working with the Native population around, specifically around outreach and uh, um, kind of case management, resource management services. And uh, those are out now, so if anybody's interested in that, I encourage you to look up on the um, health department website or reach out to one of us at the health department because I think it's going to be out for another week um, and uh, we're hoping to get some good um, folks that want to work with this and um, because there is some funds available to help. The testing situation is um, is moving around a lot. You know, there's as Sarah showed on the graph, there's a big increase in demand now and um, I, partly because of travel, partly because of just the increase in cases. So we're, uh, but we are uh, continuing to test everybody at the sites. And uh, there's been a little bit of a slowdown in terms of the turnaround time statewide that, that's at the, uh, at the state level now. Um, part of what's happening is, uh, well, a couple different things are happening. One is, is because of the weather and because of some of the contract shifts with the Verily test site, we are going to be discontinuing the Middletown site and moving that day, which was every other Wednesday, to Clear Lake. So moving forward, we'll be doing Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, every other Wednesday in Clear Lake, and then Thursday, Friday in Lakeport. We're also uh, having some conversations about possibly discontinuing the Upper Lake site as well, although the next scheduled one is not tomorrow, but the week after will be happening in Upper Lake but we're kind of having some conversations with some of the community partners about that. The problem is, is the numbers at these two sites were significantly lower than at um, Lakeport and Clear Lake. We were also having some problems with some of the um, uh, settings for it. And, uh, and also we're having to negotiate with the state and with these, with Fairly and OptumServe, which is another one about ongoing um, services. And they were not very um, 
interested in the sites with the lower numbers. So <clears throat> I think ideally what we'll try to do is be in Clear Lake three days a week and in Lakeport two days a week. Um, the uh, So the contact tracing is a bit of an issue now as well with the with the market increase in cases we are having trouble keeping up and keeping all the data um, entered into the state system and just keeping on top of everything we are getting some more help from the state uh, but those people have to be trained and kind of onboarded and it's just a you know like for example this morning when i got up uh, i had some contact with the nurses and they said they'd had 30 new cases 30 new positive cases that had entered in from 11:30 last night when they got off the off the um, computer. By the time they got up, there were 30 new cases, and you know we simply don't have the the capacity to keep up with that. So we're trying to get more written information out to people, trying to get it more um, automated. But I think people just need to realize that. Uh, you will find out about your results, but you may not have the in-depth kind of case investigation contact tracing that we were providing up until this point. And so uh, if you do get a positive test or if you are close contact with somebody, you need to take it upon yourself to inform people that you've been in contact with that they may need to get tested and uh, take precautions as well. Um, the housing situation where we're really focusing on trying to isolate and quarantine people that test positive or that are at high risk. Uh, the SSTU program continues. We still have some rooms there. Um, Elijah House is still continuing to function well with the, um, with the uh, homeless folks and they're pretty much at capacity all the time at this point. Uh, Hope Center did open up and they have uh, 10 people there now and uh, they have 20 potential beds. So they're slowly filling that up, which is a great new addition to the community. And we're really excited about that. And the warming center, we talked about that a little bit last week and Supervisor Brown brought up his interest in the fairgrounds. And I have spoken with Pastor Shannon and I think uh, Supervisor Scott is helping with that. So they, there was some financial um, requirements with the fairgrounds, but uh, they're, I think they're, they're continuing to work with that. So maybe Supervisor Scott will want to let us know after, at the end here. And um, so in terms of surge planning, this is uh, really what's being a big discussion uh, regionally and around the state. Um, uh, the Adventist in uh, St. Helena has reopened, which is a very good thing for us. That They've been closed for probably a couple months now. And so they did reopen and are back functioning, which is going to help us quite a bit. And uh, we have been meeting with the two local hospitals and with the uh, EMS services about how we're going to deal with surges and uh, doing some problem solving. And it's been very collaborative, very, uh, very helpful to meet with everybody and to try to anticipate what's coming. There have been some issues with just with transportation. They always are. We, we tend to um, be low in terms of our capacity to, to with ambulance service and i think this will be more of an issue when we have to transport more and more people out but um you know the fire chiefs and reach and everybody are, are working on trying to help us uh, uh anticipate what our needs are going to be and to deal with it and to sort of prepare for it sonoma county hospitals are pretty full i read in the newspaper this weekend that they only had a couple of icu beds available at that time but so far we seem to be able to be moving people through uh, and um, at this point, we have uh, five people in hospital, in local hospitals in the county, and I think there's something like six or seven that are out of the county, which is, this is a pretty high number for us. We've not had these numbers before. Um, the, these are the COVID positive folks. So then um, talk, oh, and then the sleep train is open now, or they're opening tomorrow. This is the large alternate care facility that's going to be opening in Sacramento. They're supposed to be able to open up as much as 200 beds. They're opening 20 to start out, and then they're going to expand as needed, which is this is a, a very positive um, development for us because I think as the regional hospitals get filled and our capacity can get filled pretty quickly, we would be moving them down to Sacramento to the sleep train as, as another option. So the vaccine development is getting a lot of um, publicity right now, and um, they are supposed to go for FDA approval. I believe it's tomorrow or, or Thursday. And um, 
but it has already been approved. The Pfizer vaccine has already been approved in, in the UK, and we assume that it will go ahead and be approved here. The plan is to start shipping as of next week, uh, and we are uh, have an allotment now of 975, which is pretty good, much higher than I thought we were going to get. And uh, so the current idea is to work through the hospitals. The first people that are going to get access are the are the acute care hospital workers, and then um, when that uh, group has gotten covered as much as they want to be covered, then we will work with the EMS and the nursing facilities. So, and I think probably that'll take up that whole shipment. And then we're not exactly sure what the next shipment will look like or where it's what's coming. They are claiming the state is claiming that they're going to get 2.2 million doses of vaccine by the end of December. And they seem to be reasonably confident with that, but, um, you know, it all remains to be seen. Um, and uh, I did want to talk a little bit about enforcement. And uh, Craig, are you on? Do you want to you want to give a little blurb about what you're doing? Or okay, so I'm on. Uh, oh. I'm afraid it's, uh, when it comes to enforcement, that's the least favorite part of doing these things. Um, for the most part, I'm really happy to report that the. The bulk of our businesses have been doing a very good job of trying to stay within these, you know, ever-changing uh, requirements. Um, for the most part, our office handles uh, outreach and education for each of the complaints that we receive. Um, complaints come in generally daily. I uh, received 16 this morning for us to follow up on and investigate. Um, investigations are conducted and determined whether or not the complaint is valid invalid or unconfirmed uh, and right now for the most part we're finding that a lot of the complaints are going down as unconfirmed um, in that at the time the complaint happened that condition may have existed but by the time we get to the investigation a day or two days later um, we're finding that the facilities are in compliance so we're just unable to confirm what happened um, but on the whole the managers of the facilities are doing a great job of responding when we ask them to talk about their masking policies or how they're controlling uh, the number of people in the stores and so forth, um, it's been very good. That is not to say that we do not have a handful of facilities that are reaching a recalcitrant stage. Um, they are openly defying the public orders um, and are posting on Facebook. We've seen a lot of complaints come in uh, linking Facebook uh, posts from a business saying, well, we're staying open. We don't care what they say. Um, unfortunately, we're bound to have a certain number of facilities um, that are going to do that. We are contacting the supervisors that these uh, facilities are in um, to kind of work with them. We're also working with the cities, uh, either in Clear Lake or Lakeport, to see if they want to kind of help out in those regards as well. Um, sadly, we have been requested by the state to provide a list of facilities which have had repeated confirmed violations. And that list was roughly a dozen facilities um, that have been sent to the state's enforcement task force um, for them to uh, research and follow up on. Um, but the overall is that most of our businesses, the overwhelming majority, are really doing the best that they can under these circumstances. And you know, we appreciate those efforts. Thank you, Craig. And um, so the uh, the other issue about this is the um, the uh, sort of code enforcement positions that were approved by the board uh, a couple months ago. We're in the process of uh, trying to get the job description and kind of get the whole um, hiring situation together. And I think that's going to get posted in the next week or so. And so we're hoping to get some good candidates and get some training and get things going probably soon after the first of the year. Um, the uh, So the last little piece of this is just we are kind of, uh, we're in a very challenging state. I think it's probably the next couple months are going to be very hard. And there's kind of no way around that. I know everybody's tired and I know everybody's frustrated and the businesses are hurting and the kids aren't in school and it's in a lot of places. and. It's just been very challenging. It's been going on now nine months, and um, I think we have a couple months more of 
very difficult times. And this is going to be probably the hardest because of we're going to start seeing more and more people getting sick and we're going to start knowing people that are getting sick. And I think as much as people can really kind of focus and buckle down and just stay home and kind of delay the parties and delay the social events, the better it's going to be for everybody. I, I really think we are looking at the light at the end of the tunnel, probably in a couple months by March, April, things are going to be looking a lot better. We're going to start having more access to vaccine. We'll be able to be outside more and to open up the outdoor dining and things like that. And so I just think if people can, the, ho the Christmas holidays are coming up, the more you can just stay home, not mix with other families, not mix with your friends. Uh, and, uh, especially indoors, the better off it's going to be and the more people will be safe. Um, the uh, vaccine will be coming more and more available. It's not clear in terms of the numbers, and they have a sort of a tier system of how we're going to distribute it, but probably most likely it's going to be something like April, May, before it's really available in the general public. And uh, so I'm just, you know, at this point, it's not clear when we would go into the stay at home order, um, but uh, I think if things continue to worsen, that's coming. Uh, you know, is it gonna be a week? Is it gonna be a couple of weeks? From where we were last week, we're about stable. So it doesn't seem to be rapidly deteriorating, but I think the more people can stay home, the more people can work from home, the more people don't go out in uh in dying outdoors even but just maybe go get to go food and go home the better off it's going to be and the less the transmission is going to be because the goal here is to try to keep the transmission down as best we can until we can get the vaccine out and get people vaccinated so um thank you for the opportunity to talk about this and you know we can talk about any questions you have thank you very much dr pace and mr weatherby for the update uh, and also for um, Sarah, I forget your last name, Marcados, I believe, Maricos. Uh, thank you very much for all the updates. Any questions or comments from uh, the board? Uh, Supervisor Scott, you were uh, mentioned earlier, wondering if you could provide us an update on uh, the fairgrounds. Um, yes, the committee for the warming center meets every week. Um, our volunteer group has been getting bigger, so we are really trying to find a place that we can have the warming center open Monday through Friday. So we're, we're going in that direction. Um, I do have a question for Mr. Weatherby about um, your investigating. Are you also investigating um, stores that people aren't being allowed in because they don't have a mask? I know that came up in my district um, that, a, that a store owner, you know, denied entry to somebody because they, they weren't wearing a mask. I don't think that would be, Craig, you, you're probably not doing that, Craig, because, um, uh, you know, he's really doing the health and environmental health uh, investigation. So I'm not sure how we would address that. You know, I guess if, if we had a complaint, we'd probably go talk to them and um, see what was going on and let them know that uh, people should, um, some people do have medical reasons to not do that and uh, so I think we would address that the same way we do that if we're getting complaints that people aren't wearing masks is kind of go have a conversation and education session so um, I'm not sure it would be Craig it would probably be one of the other folks that would be going I don't know what would you agree yeah we have not been addressing those concerns um, our focus has solely been on complaints of masking not being enforced or indoor dining not being uh, prohibitions being enforced things like that um, we haven't really been working in the other direction any thank you very much any other comments or questions I just wanted to Supervisor highlight something Crandall? and i know we probably it's probably been said or i know yesterday's been discussed when we're in COVID recovery um but just just for the public to hear the the, the situation where it states the rancho uh 15 percent so is that countywide or is that rancho wide so northern california um or is that not even on the same realm no it's uh the 15 percent is for the whole um region region yeah because i mean really the way it is in our county i think we often don't have 15 percent capacity in the icus just because of the way the hospitals transfer patients back and forth we're sort of a 
often transferring folks to the higher levels of care. And so it's a very fluid thing. And for us, really thinking about how patients are going to get care, it's really a regional regional discussion and a regional analysis. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? So I, I do have a, a couple of questions. One, you were saying um, last week about how the survey for contact tracing might go online. Uh, is that already happening, or are we still waiting on that to um, get started? And the reason I um, ask is because you mentioned that it's getting difficult with the number of cases that you see on a daily basis, and just hoping that that might help out uh, by basically doing almost like a, a self-service contact trace um, survey. Let me check and see. I know they've been working on it. Um, let me let me ask Carolyn and see if she knows. Okay. And then w w while you're getting that, I know uh, some of the issues that I've heard about the testing sites, uh, especially with Upper Lake and Middletown, is just because it's off and on, off and on, well, it al alternates weeks, and then there's certain days that it's not happening because there's smoke, there's whatever the purpose or reason is that it's not happening. It's been a little difficult for people to have a reliable uh, source. I think that that's been more uh, of the reason why people are uh, sporadically going to those versus going to Lakeport or Clear Lake, where it's very uh, stringent uh, schedule uh, that they continue to have. So hopefully... Um, we will have less and less of those deviations from the set schedule uh, as we move forward. Um, the question that was asked at the state level, and I'm not sure if I'm getting concurrence from the numbers that I see, and maybe the numbers I see are incorrect. I've been going to, uh, you, you um, directed us, Dr. Pace, to go to LA Times. I do find that they have some pretty good data uh, on the state level and then on a per county level, and I appreciate that. I've been looking at it since then. And it shows that we as a county only have eight ICU beds. I thought we had more when the surge uh, capacity increased. Um, and based on what the state responded to a CSAC conference call we had last week, that the 15% uh, is based on the surge capacity, not based on your standard capacity. Can you speak to that and, and clarify my confusion? Well, this, the, uh, so one thing is, is just to your first question about the, um, the uh, survey online for contact tracing. We are using it now. There's been some glitches with the state uh, system, but we are using it. It can only be used for people that have cell phones, though, so because it, we're going through a cell phone number, so not everybody's going to be getting it. But um, that is, uh, but it is available and it's being used some now. Okay. Um, the ICU beds. So our standard setup is four ICU beds at each hospital. Both of those can expand somewhat. You know, it's. Um, the uh, the uh, question with these things is is um, uh, you can expand a little bit easily. So, like each of the hospitals can expand uh, one or two beds easily without too much trouble. It's sort of set up like that with an extra room and things. And then if it gets bad, like it was in New York, we can expand more. There are beds available. There is space available, but it's going to be not. It's going to be suboptimal. The uh, questioning is really staffing. So the way they talk about it is staffed beds. And so the way I understand it is um, uh, we are already experiencing a little bit of uh, some challenges with staffing. And uh, so the uh, I'm not sure what exactly the number they're using locally. The hospitals communicate directly with the state for the ICU capacity. but. Um, it's not exactly a black and white number. Uh, it's more, uh, I think they're probably using uh, the eight because of staffing and because that's sort of the listed um, thing. I don't, you know, even if we expand, the most we're going to get to is something like uh, 15 or something like that, mm -hmm. unless we're really, really pinched. And having the staff that's going to be able to manage those kinds of patients, I think is going to be pretty difficult to to find here without some state resources coming in. Okay. Thank you for the response. Any other questions or comments from the board before I open it up to the public? 
Okay, Jake, let's go ahead and open up the Zoom room and see if anyone has a comment or question. All right, I sent a mute request out to the Zoom floor. If you would like to make a comment, please unmute and state your first and last name. And I see that uh, Terry Logsdon had her hand raised. Can you hear me? Yes. I don't know if I'm unmuted yet. Yes, we can hear you. Great, thank you so much. So my question is for Mr. Weatherby. He mentioned that um, he received complaints and he follows up on him. And I'm just wondering if the complaint process is still going through MOAC or do you receive the complaints directly? Yes, uh, all complaints are still going through the Mohawk, although occasionally we do have folks who contact, uh, will contact our office directly. Um, when we receive a complaint like that, we will forward to the Mohawk and then where everything will be compiled and then we'll start the investigation once they uh, kind of add it to their list. Um, but yes, uh, for the most part, all complaints are still going through the Mohawk. Thank you very much. Anyone else have a comment or question from the public in the Zoom room? Okay, hearing none, looking at the public here in the board chambers, any comments or questions for Dr. Pace, Mr. Weatherby? No, nope. okay. Uh, anything else from the board as I bring it back to the board? All right, thank you for all your questions, Dr. Pace, Mr. Weatherby, and uh, Ms. Maricos. Thank you very much for your update. Really appreciate that, and I think we got you out in time to get to your meeting as well. Thank you.